Welcome, everyone. This is Robin Duncan, and I'm here with my husband, Terry Macy. Hi, everyone. It is great to be with you. We are here for the A Course in Miracles Global Study Group. Tonight we are on Chapter 14, Class Number 6, or we call that 14.6, and that means that we have already had six classes, including today, on this chapter. I think we will have probably two more to complete the chapter. Today we will be covering Sections 8 and 9 of Chapter 14. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Let's pause and take a nice, deep, relaxing breath. Let's turn inward together. This is the place where all healing occurs, right here in the mind. Dear God, we come to you today so glad to be in the presence of one another as we share the words offered by Jesus via the Holy Spirit. We are so glad to have this inner guidance within us, the guide that holds every answer and promises us that we will be successful in our journey of awakening. Today we are willing to remember to turn inward, that as our eyes show us things that we are troubled by or that we do not understand, We must remember that we are the dreamer of our dream, and as we turn inward, you are there to help us with any problem, large or small. If we feel that we are not making progress, to give it to you again and again, and be unwilling to judge it, as you have taught us that sometimes we do not know whether we have advanced or retreated and we do not actually have the context to judge it for ourselves. That's why we must leave it for you. Sometimes we would like to see a certain outcome or result. If it doesn't happen fast enough, we feel that we have failed or you have failed us. Tonight you hear our willingness that we are not going to do that. We are going to stand strong together. We are going to hold out for the success that you have promised us, and we are going to listen to only your voice, even if the timeline is not as we have decided it should be. You have our attention. We choose to be happy learners, and we are standing by as you lead us through and around every seeming obstacle, and we are grateful. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Tonight we are going to be talking about the holy meeting place. And as you'll find out, this is a place within us where God is already there. Our completeness is already done. The answers have already been given. And in that holy meeting place, this is the place to go when something seems like it's out of whack. We have to turn inward instead of outward. We've learned through the course that when we look to things outside of ourselves, it's almost like we're worshiping other gods. That may not seem like it to you, but if we're looking for something outside of us to save us or make things better or make things right, then we are looking to effects to save us. Well, you can imagine that this does not work. Because an effect is something that is the consequence of a cause. So we must always come back to the cause, which is in our mind, that is causing the consequence that we see. We must come back into the mind and be willing to take responsibility that, yes, we might have some thoughts that are projecting what we see that is troubling us, and that we're willing to forgive ourselves for that, then we can turn those thoughts over to the Holy Spirit. But before we do, we must refuse those thoughts. I'll take lack as an example. Let's say your whole life that you've had a situation where you feel that you have been struggling. No matter how far you get ahead, it seems that you take three steps back. Then you work hard again, and you think you're getting ahead, and you take two steps back. You just 
keep going forward and backward and forward and backward, and the seesaw in your mind continues, sometimes it's very tempting to try to fix that through a better job outside of you, to try to get more clients if you are self-employed, or maybe to get a loan, or to make money at a second job, or some way to fix that problem outside of you. But instead, we must turn inward, because the condition of lack is not a condition that was imposed by God. This condition is one that we made up. When we bought that separation could happen, we bought the whole package that comes with the idea that separation is real, which it is not. But if separation is real in our mind, it comes with lack and suffering and sacrifice and pain and sorrow and grief and guilt and confusion and sickness and death and all the rest. We bought the package deal. But we can just as soon step right back out of the tunnel we had stepped into in our mind. What we must do is refuse the image. Every time you see lack, if you see a person that appears homeless on the sidewalk as you are there, pause. One of the greatest things you can do for that person in the moment is to declare the truth of them, that God did not create homelessness. This is not the truth. Holy Spirit, please decide for me about this. We don't have to stand there and see them completely released from it. Our part is to shut down the lie. We are the ones that are holding the idea of lack and struggle and homelessness and delay and all the rest. If we are the dreamer of our dream and the dreamer is not actively shutting that down as a lie, a lie, then Holy Spirit must wait to show us what is true until we have changed our mind and made that decision. You see, we ask Holy Spirit often to show us the truth, help me to see this differently, but at the same time, we're still holding on to the lie. We are the ones that created the sad story, and we forgive ourselves. We're learning how that got there. We're learning that judging ourselves is the wrong way to go because it's the same as judging someone else. We're just here to question it so that we can refuse it, give it to the Holy Spirit, and ask for the truth instead. So if there was something you're trying to do and it seems that the money is not there, you might be trying to pay for college for one of your kids, you might be trying to go on a vacation, you might be trying to pay your next month's mortgage, you might be trying to keep the lights on, You might be just trying to find some food today. There are many degrees of how we experience lack. They're all the same. It's a lie. It's a lie. We have to stand up to it. And what I just heard in the shower a few minutes ago, Holy Spirit loves to talk to me in the shower, maybe because I'm just quiet and listening and paying attention. But what I felt like I heard is, Once we're able to hold the truth in our mind with some level of consistency, that we're willing to shut the door on the lie long enough to be aware of the truth, then we will see it with our eyes. The effect can't materialize in our purview, in what we're looking at, on our radar screen. It cannot show up there until it is given a home within us. I think of a simple example, and this is using an illusion to explain illusions, but sometimes it helps to just bring things home. There was a time when a friend of mine was without funds and very worried about it. She asked me to pray for her, and I told her I would. I just sat down in my meditation, and I just sat there, and I just saw her absolutely at peace. Everything was in order. I saw her just for the fun of my meditation, just with hundreds all around her, $100 bills all around her, and that she was just smiling and happy and everything's taken care of. I know that's all illusion, but I needed to turn my own mind around and just see it differently. 
it's almost like we've stepped into a tunnel and for the time being we just need to step back out a little bit it's okay to use an illusion as a prop to prime your mind to see things bigger see things differently i knew my friend was struggling so i just needed to see it differently if even in my own illusion and i just saw that around her spent some time seeing it a few minutes but a few minutes strung together i really gave it some attention and it was funny because a little later that day she called and she sounded really really happy she said that she had just come from a client and working with a client that the client said I'd really like to buy a package of what you offer and I don't know when I'll be able to do it but I just happen to have some extra money so can I go ahead and buy a package now and then we can just set it up later when we will complete it she said this woman just whipped out this wad of 100 dollar bills and just paid her all these 100 dollar bills she was just flabbergasted she went from nothing to many hundreds of dollars by the end of the day i know that doesn't sound like much for some but i know that when you have nothing and i know what that feels like that when you have a few hundred dollars sitting in your palm it sure feels different pause pause long enough close that door on lack shut the door on illusion he's asking us to keep that door closed we're not here to create the truth we're not here to create abundance we are abundance we are born of abundance and the door is always open we're the ones that close it every time we decide that lack is real and we validate it or we see something in front of us with our eyes and we do not do one thing to shut it down remember this is just in consciousness maybe you turn on the television and someone's on a show that you're watching and they're saying that they're losing their job and they might be losing their home they don't know what they'll do don't just change the channel that's coming from between your ears the ego is very sneaky that way to make it look like it doesn't matter it's just part of the day pause practice shut down that idea say out loud to yourself if you're able to do that dear god i know you did not create a condition where i could lose my home nor could they i know you did not create the condition where we could be lacking or suffering or struggling or delayed i want the truth instead of this and i refuse to let that into my holy mind to different response not what we're used to but it brings results. I feel like in the shower a little while ago that Holy Spirit said, you know, for anyone if they will keep that door of illusion closed long enough because we're the ones that are opening it back up again and again. If we will close it with some level of consistency, then we will see the effects of our choice. When we close the door to illusion, and you might see us going straight to that meeting place the power of god the wisdom of god within us joined by the holy spirit joined by the light of christ when we keep that door closed and we will not validate reinforce give our attention to lack pain suffering sorrow sickness there is so much knocking on our door shut the door just in your mind in your prayer Holy Spirit will guide you about specifically what to do, how to do it, what to say, when to say it. That will come from higher guidance after the door is closed. When the door to illusion is left open and we keep staring out the door and engaging what is there, we will not hear the voice of Holy Spirit. He tells us again and again and again and again and again that illusions and truth are irreconcilable you must forfeit one to be aware of the other i know that we may not be able to do that full time but we can certainly do it for minutes at a time and we must and i join with you there as we go to that holy meeting place we're going to do that together we're going to keep that door of illusion closed and when it tries to open up again with our own ego knocking 
we're going to remember our commitment to each other to keep it closed. God did not create lack or suffering or sickness or pain or sorrow or a body. We are infinite spirit. It is God's will that we are happy and that we know the greatness of his love. We will know the truth of this once we are no longer letting that door be open to something that is much, much less desirable. So today we're going to have Terry kick us off with a little spiritual humor. All right, I'm ready to go here. And our spiritual humor is called Life After Death. So Bob called into work one morning to talk to his boss to say that he had to take the day off as his only uncle had passed away and would be attending his funeral that day. Bob's boss was very supportive and without question gave Bob the day off to attend the funeral. The very next day, when Bob came into work, his boss asked him to step into his office. The two of them sat down and his boss asked him, So, I was curious if you believe in life after death. Bob quickly responded back to his boss very adamantly, certainly not. There is no proof that there is life after death. Bob's boss responded by saying, well, there's proof now. A short while after you called me yesterday to go to your uncle's funeral, your uncle came in here to the office looking for you to take you to lunch. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) So there is life after death. (laughs) (laughs) Busted, right? (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Terry. (laughs) Always good to just shake it up a little. Okay, let's get started with Chapter 14, Section 8 on the Holy Meeting Place. Paragraph 1. In the darkness, you have obscured the glory God gave you and the power he bestowed upon his guiltless son. All this lies hidden in every darkened place, shrouded in guilt and in the dark denial of innocence. Behind the dark doors you have closed lies nothing, because nothing can obscure the gift of God. This is telling us a few things. It's definitely saying that guilt is one of the ways that we shroud our innocence. We have these gifts of God that we are covering up with the idea of guilt. So every time we think, I'm not doing enough, I should be doing more, I did it wrong, I should be doing it right, or we think those same thoughts about another person, whenever we are casting guilt on anyone, we are shrouding our innocence and theirs. This is where the gifts of God become unknown to us because they're obscured. It's just like covering your eyes with your hand. The light is still there, but the light is obscured. You cannot see it. Let's go with sentence four. It is the closing of the doors that interferes with recognition of the power of God that shines in you. Banish not power from your mind, but let all that would hide your glory be brought to the judgment of the Holy Spirit and there undone. Whom he would save for glory is saved for it. He has promised the Father that through him you would be released from littleness to glory. To what he promised God, he is wholly faithful, for he shares with God the promise that was given him to share with you. Terry and I both just loved this paragraph, and especially sentence 5 through 8. Because he's telling us there that we are the ones that are banishing the power from our mind. The power is already within us. If we cover it up with guilt or seeing ourselves as less than whole or someone else as lacking or sick, then we are hiding the glory that is within us. But we can instead choose not to do that. And that way everything is brought to the judgment of the Holy Spirit, and there it is undone. So sentence five is so powerful. He's asking us to not banish our power from our mind 
Instead, bring all of the things that trouble us, all of our judgments, to the Holy Spirit and let them be undone. Sentence 7 is so beautiful, you might want to write it down for yourself and put it out in front of you. He has promised the Father that through him you would be released from littleness to glory. So there it is that you could say Jesus promised God that through him and through the Holy Spirit that we are going to be released from littleness to glory. What I love about that, he made a promise on our behalf. He made a promise to handle that for us. And I just want you to feel the pressure come off of your own shoulders. We talked before about job description where our part is forgiveness and listening to the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit has all kinds of things to do in Holy Spirit's columns. So this is one of those things that, in fact, there has been a promise made to God that through Christ, through Holy Spirit, we are going to be released from littleness to glory. It tells us further that what he promised God is faithful, and he shares with God that promise as it was given to him to share with us. Isn't that beautiful? Paragraph number two, where we talk about the gifts of the Father. He shares it still for you. Everything that promises otherwise, great or small, however much or little valued, he will replace with the one promise given unto him to lay upon the altar to your father and his son. No altar stands to God without his son, and nothing brought there that is not equally worthy of both, but will be replaced by gifts wholly acceptable to father and to son. There's a few places in the Course where he tells us that Every time we choose to ask for the truth instead of illusions or when we are choosing to see our brothers and our sisters as whole and complete even when they appear to be lacking or unwhole, whenever we're taking that step to choose to see beyond the illusion, turn to Holy Spirit and ask for guidance to remind ourselves of who we are and who the other person is in oneness with us. Every one of these times, these are gifts to God. And there's an altar within us, and it's like we're placing diamonds or gold on that altar. He's telling us that every time we do this, this is a gift to God. This is an honoring of our Creator, because our Creator knows the truth and nothing else, nothing less. But we have forgotten. So every time... We do the smallest little thing as a step towards what is true. It is a gift. It tells us here that those gifts are going to be replaced with the gifts of God. And those gifts are going to be gifts that are worthy of not only us, but Christ, God, everyone, everywhere. That the gifts that are replacing our gifts are going to be so great, more than we could imagine. Sometimes we think that we pray and it doesn't matter or who cares anyway. But every time you pray, it is like a trumpet in heaven. I believe angels surround you. There is no little prayer. If you lift up a prayer for a child, you see that's hurting. Or you lift up a prayer to see things differently. Or you lift up a prayer to be willing to see one of your loved ones succeed at a job interview. Whatever it is, it's a gift, and that gift is acknowledged, honored, and it will come back multiplied. Leave that door closed to illusions and leave the door open to the truth, and you will see your house of light. Sentence 5. Can you offer guilt to God? You cannot then offer it to his son. I don't think any one of us in our right mind, would want to offer guilt to God. It feels like, okay, God, the all in all, knows everything, knows a lot more than I do. God's probably not guilty, but maybe I am or maybe you are. It's easy to toss guilt around amongst us 
seeming humans. He's telling us there that we would not offer guilt to God, probably. Therefore, we should not offer it to his son because we're one. And so what we would offer to one and not the other, then that's wholly based on separation. If we would not offer guilt to God, then we must be unwilling to cast it upon ourselves. Sentence 7. For they are not apart, and gifts to one are offered to the other. You know not God because you know not this, and yet you do know God and also this. We stop there because this sounds a little bit like a contradiction. (laughs) It says in 8, you know not God because you know not this, in terms of you might be casting guilt on yourself or someone else, but not on God. So when that happens, you're not going to know God because you're actually listening to the voice of the ego which is calling upon guilt, and you're allowing that in. In that case, the truth is obscured yet again. The next sentence, number nine, it says, and yet you do know God and also this. We're not crazy here. It's not a uh, contradiction. But what it's calling upon in number nine is there's a place within us that knows this. There's a place within us that knows that separation is not real, There's a place within us that knows that God is our creator, and there's a love that is so deep, so rich, that we have not forgotten it. And that's probably why everyone here has this deep love for God that we haven't really seen in a way that we understand, and yet we know this love. I was born with this love, and I know you all feel that same way, or you wouldn't be here spending your Saturday evening just talking about something we cannot quite see or remember. We love our Creator. We know this. We know that there is no guilt in God, and we know there's no guilt in us or anyone else. But we have forgotten, and that's why we must practice remembering what is true. So they are both true. The first sentence where we know not God because we keep obscuring God with what is not true Yet we do know God. We also know that guilt is not real. Number 10. All this is safe within you, where the Holy Spirit shines. He shines not in division, but in the meeting place where God, united with his Son, speaks to his Son through him. Communication between what cannot be divided cannot cease. The holy meeting place of the unseparated Father and His Son lies in the Holy Spirit and in you. All interference in the communication that God Himself wills with His Son is quite impossible here. Unbroken and uninterrupted, love flows constantly between the Father and the Son, as both would have it be, and so it is. There was a time when I was shown a little graphic that helped explain this idea. I used to see my mind as split because the Course said my mind was split. I thought if I drew a circle that represented my mind and maybe half of my mind is focused on the truth and half of my mind is focused on the lie and that's why I have a split mind and that's why I'm confused sometimes because I have this split mind. And that was further refined for me. This is what I believe this paragraph is alluding to. There's this whole communication thing going on between God, Holy Spirit, us, uninterrupted. It's never been interrupted. It's almost like in the center of our mind, there's this whole perfect conversation going on that is beautiful and heavenly, and it has nothing wrong with it. It's almost like our mind is this circle. It's not that half of our mind is dark or focused on a lie. Our mind is perfect because God created us with a perfect mind. So the whole circle is of the light. The whole circle is of God. The whole circle of our mind is in perfect communication. The problem is it's like we are in that circle, but we're choosing to focus on let's put an X in our diagram outside the circle 
we're choosing to focus on something that does not exist. For the purpose of the picture, we'll put the X outside the circle, but that implies it exists, but it doesn't. So let's just say you're in this perfect conversation of truth, love, and everything good, but in that moment, let's say you cover your eyes and your ears, and you're focusing on what is not real. And that's the problem. That's what shrouds our ability to realize the conversation that's going on. We are focusing on something other than what is true. We tend to think we're focusing on something other than what is real, but that the other thing is also real, and we think we're toggling from one thing to the other. We're looking at what is real within us versus something that is not real, that has no power, that has no substance. But because we are focusing on it, we are projecting it, and we're making it look real. So your mind is split because part of your attention is focused on something that doesn't exist. It's not that half of your mind is dark. It's not. God didn't create you to have a darkened mind. Your mind is perfect, created in perfection. But your attention is not on that. It's on something that you've created that is a figment of your imagination and most of your attention is going there, and that blocks your awareness of what is real. So it's an undoing of what never was. It's not a fixing. We're not trying to conjure up the truth. We're not trying to earn our way back to God. It's already within us. It's already there. But we must pull our attention to the present moment and engage with what is true and abandon that which is not so under the guidance of the ego, abandon that whole idea, and then we will begin to see again what is real. Paragraph number three. Let your mind wander, not through darkened corridors, away from light's center. You and your brother may choose to lead yourselves astray, but you can be brought together only by the guide appointed for you. He will surely lead you to where God and his son await your recognition. Let's put a box around that word only in the top line there, or on my page it's the top line. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can bring us back to what is true because we have been focusing just our attention on what is not real. It has frightened us. So it's not that we're bad people. We've just got preoccupied on what we see because we think it's real. And then we try to solve it because our ego tells us to. We think, wow, if I just focus on it a little bit more or I try something different, I might be able to change this and make it better. If we instead come back to that holy meeting place and realize that it's Holy Spirit that is going to do the healing of our misperception, but we have to go ahead and close that door on the lie. Sentence four. They are joined in giving you the gift of oneness, before which all separation vanishes. Unite with what you are. You cannot join with anything except reality. God's glory and his sons belong to you in truth. They have no opposite and nothing else can you bestow upon yourself. We have no opposite. If we just spend time a few minutes a day, maybe 10 minutes a day, and purely focus on who you are, that I am God's holy, precious child, I am free of all limits, I am free of the past, I am changeless, it is God's will that I am happy, and that I know the greatness of his love, and that I am here to co-create with God. I am blessed beyond measure. I am rich beyond riches. I have everything I need. God gave me everything when I was conceived. There is nothing missing and nothing lacking. There is nothing that can intrude on the happiness that has been given me. Well, those words might seem empty at first, 
But if you sit with them every day, just imagine them until you can feel it or feel a little smile of optimism coming to your face until one day you think, who am I? And your first answer is, I am the holy child of God, perfectly blessed and whole and safe and free. When that becomes your first answer, you'll know that you've at least Reach to the other side of that boat. So let's reach for it. Let's practice it. Let's learn to let it be our first response in who am I and our first response in who someone else is, even when they're being difficult or entirely unreasonable. Let that be our response in our mind as the reaction to the response and then Holy Spirit giving us the words for communication. Let's go to paragraph four. There is no substitute for truth, and truth will make this plain to you as you are brought into the place where you must meet with truth. And there you must be led through gentle understanding, which can lead you nowhere else. So the truth is there. We do not need to conjure it up. It's already within us. It's already done. And just the same as taking your hand down from your eyes, the light would be there. It's not a process. It's the undoing of the block. And in our case, the block is that we are focused on this crazy idea of separation. We're focused on the idea that the holy child of God is a body, frail, vulnerable, powerless, doesn't make the right decisions, floundering, and all the rest. As we focus on what is not true, this will be a block to what is true. Holy Spirit will intervene and heal those thoughts for you after you refuse them. As long as you're entertaining those thoughts or worrying about those thoughts or thinking those thoughts, giving them any of your time or attention, as long as you're doing that, Holy Spirit cannot show you what is true because you've already made your choice that you'd rather give your attention to illusions. I know it sounds crazy sometimes, but this is what brings the healing. There's a sequence. Holy Spirit is always with us, and I know this. I feel that presence. But what I have noticed is that the healing happens once I, as the dreamer, have abandoned my story in the dream. It doesn't mean I have to get up off of my couch. It's not about doing. It's about what you're thinking. And even if you're looking at a very difficult situation, let's say one of your loved ones all of a sudden is diagnosed with some kind of illness, if you will pause and say out loud to yourself if you need to that God did not create illness and we are not required to suffer that I will not worship the God of sickness, that God created us whole, complete, safe, loved, and provided for. Holy Spirit, decide for us about this illness. Decide for us about this situation. Now we have given a genuine invitation to Holy Spirit. But if I'm staring at the illness and I'm terrified of the illness and I believe the illness has the power and I'm saying, Holy Spirit, I'm willing to see that differently, But really, I'm still terrified by the illness because I believe it has the power. I will not know where my power is. It cannot be where it is and also where it is not at the same time. You must shut it down in your mind, even if to declare for yourself, God did not create the condition of sickness. God did not create a condition where One of my loved ones could suffer for any reason. And then turn to your prayer, ask Holy Spirit to take it over, decide all of it, because you want the truth. Instead, not of the illusion, but I would literally call it a lie. I want the truth instead of this lie. And remind yourself of the deception of your own ego. It takes practice. It gets easier every day. And you can use less and less words every day. And that's okay. Sentence four. Well, before I read that, I just wanted to add 
also that I very much appreciate. Sentence number three, I led a lot of my life totally believing that the more sacrifice, lack I could endure, the further I could go without, the greater the prize in, from God and the happier he would be. So the further I could go carrying a burden and sacrifice, that that's what it was all about. I remember even as a kid, I used to say to myself, if I can push myself beyond what I'm able to do and ride my bicycle up the top of this hill, he'll be happy with me about that. <laughs> so I just, that was how I lived my life. And to see here, and there you must be led through gentle understanding, which can lead nowhere else. Thank you. It's Thank just you. so sweet. And love is gentle. And it's not asking you to suffer. It's asking you to remember who you are so that you will not suffer. Beautiful example, Terry. Sentence number four. Where God is, there are you. Such is the truth. Nothing can change the knowledge given you by God into unknowingness. Everything God created knows its creator. For this is how creation is accomplished by the creator and by his creations. In the holy meeting place are joined the father and his creations and the creations of his son with them together. There is one link that joins them all together, holding them in the oneness out of which creation happens. And that link we may or may not understand the link that holds all of us together with God in that holy meeting place. But what we can do is turn inward and just imagine going there. When I go into my meditations, I go in with less and less questions every day, and I basically show up and say, I'm here. This is your time to use as you wish. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm paying attention. Just being in that holy meeting place where we come to honor, to be grateful, to listen, to allow, and that if Holy Spirit has something to say or share, that would be a wonderful place to do it because my attention is wholly turned within me. So that's one way that you can really begin to honor that holy meeting place within you. You might imagine a beautiful white blanket in your mind. You just go sit on that white blanket and invite Holy Spirit or Christ to join you there and give yourself some time to just be in that holy place. Paragraph number five. The link with which the Father joins himself to those he gives the power to create can never be dissolved. Heaven itself is union with all of creation and with its one creator. And heaven remains the will of God for you. Lay no gifts other than this upon your altars, for nothing can coexist with it. Here your little offerings are brought together with the gift of God, and only what is worthy of the Father will be accepted by the Son for whom it is intended. To whom God gives himself, he is given. Your little gifts will vanish on the altar where he has placed his own. I think what this tells me is that the gift of God is so great. We have forgotten what that is. Every time we offer our little gift, it's not at all being minimized. It's just saying that every time you do this, it is cherished, but at some point, we're going to remember the gift of our Creator, which is so much greater than anything that we could even fathom. And that's where it's telling us our little gifts will vanish on the altar where God has placed His own. So there is such great reward in remembering what is true. Let's go to section number nine on the reflection of holiness. Paragraph number one. The atonement does not make holy. You were created holy. It merely brings unholiness to holiness, or what you made to what you are. 
Atonement is described in many different ways in the Course. I know one definition of atonement is that nothing could happen to the Son of God without his consent. The atonement is to realize that all power is within you. Another definition of atonement is that the separation never occurred, to have that realization that separation never occurred. Here it's saying that atonement isn't the process of making something holy because you're already holy, but it brings our version of unholiness to holiness or brings our illusions to the truth. It brings what we made or miscreated back to what we are and what already is. So it is also defined as somewhat of a process, the process of bringing illusions to the truth, but it's through that process that we ultimately realize that the separation did not occur, that we are not separate, and that the power of God is within us. It's not outside of us. There is no power outside of us. And that recognition and the process of that recognition could be said to be the atonement. I like to break that word into three parts, at one meant. So we're getting back to the realization of our oneness with God as it has always been. Sentence four. Bringing illusion to truth, or the ego to God, is the Holy Spirit's only function. I love that sentence because it just takes the pressure off. We're always practicing, all of us together, and we're standing up to our illusions, and we're trying to remember the right prayers and words to say and all that. But the Holy Spirit's only function is to bring illusions to the truth. But remember, that cannot be accomplished until we wholly invite him. We can't halfway do it. I like to use that example of, say we're walking west, but we're telling Holy Spirit we'd like to walk east. You can't walk both directions. You can't walk towards illusions and towards the truth at the same time. So Holy Spirit is going to bring everything that we've got over here in the west on our illusions, all of the problems, preoccupations, everything that's holding us back. It's Holy Spirit's only function to bring all that over here to the truth. But that cannot be done until we look at our illusions and we abandon those thought forms that are holding it all in place and we ask genuinely, sincerely for the truth instead of our illusions. We acknowledge that we are the dreamer and that's where it's coming from and we forgive ourselves for that. But remember, it's not your job to bring illusions to the truth. It's the Holy Spirit's only function. You do have help. Thank goodness. Sentence five. Keep not your making from your father, for hiding it has cost you knowledge of him and of yourself. I just wanted to make the point that when he's talking about keep not your making from the father, now we are here to co-create with God, but when we are engaging illusions, that is called making instead of creating. So we are making something up, basically, instead of actually creating or co-creating or extending something that is real. So he's like, keep not your making from your father. When we do miscreate, when we do make up something, and now it seems to be hurting us, he's saying, don't keep that from God, because hiding it has cost you the knowledge of God and of yourself. So this is the invitation to bring all the messes, all the muck that we have created. He's saying, don't hide that from God. Bring that to God, and it will be revealed to you how it can be undone. Remember, Holy Spirit's only function is to undo it. Don't be afraid to bring whatever you think you have failed at, where you have made your mistakes. Bring it right into your prayer and offer it to the Holy Spirit. These are your gifts to God. Give him your burdens and let those burdens be undone is a gift to him. Sentence six. The knowledge is safe, but where is your safety apart from it? The making of time to take the place of timelessness 
lay in the decision to be not as you are. Thus truth was made past, and the present was dedicated to illusion, and the past too was changed and interposed between what always was and now. If we look at that idea of time, he's telling us that we made up time. We made it up to replace timelessness. Well, that seems like a silly idea, but we did it. We took time and we laid it right over timelessness. Now we have limits. If you're in traffic and you have 15 minutes to get somewhere, you have 15 minutes to get somewhere. You no longer are connected to the idea of the timelessness from which you are a part of. We are learning to take what we have made and give it to the Holy Spirit. So the next time you might be delayed in traffic, you can pause and say, wait a minute, I'm not bound by time because God created me in timelessness. How could I possibly be late? (laughs) So Holy Spirit, decide for me about all of this. And my goal is peace. So what we've just done is we have refused that crazy idea of time. We have instead opted to remember timelessness, which is part of the truth. Even if we don't know what that means, we must choose it for Holy Spirit to show us what that looks like. Sentence 10. The past that you remember never was and represents only the denial of what always was. There's another wall quote that I love. (laughs) So the (laughs) past that you remember, all the things, all the things you did wrong, all the things you did right, all the ways you were hurt, all the ways you might have been abused, everything that caused you pain or suffering or sadness or guilt, the past that you remember never was. And that's hard to realize, but it's helpful because if you will choose to understand, this is where your freedom is. The past represents only the denial of what always was. Remember, the truth is changeless. It is eternal. It is pure light and love. So as we have this whole past that we have assembled, this big story about who we think we are, and where we think we came from and where that's probably going to lead us, as we hold on to that past, it is not real. It represents the denial of what is real. It doesn't mean you're going to lose all the good things that happened to you. As you release the past, only love is real. So everything you love, everything you enjoy, everything that is great, this goes with you in eternity. Because love is real. But everything that was less than love or less than loving, this is what disappears into nothingness. So let's realize that the past that you remember never was. It's not any different than having a dream. Then you wake up. We're just not awake yet all the way. And we can imagine that. The past represents the denial of what always was. But when we get this and we offer that to the Holy Spirit and we say, I'm going to give you my past, the whole thing, take it from me and heal it for me. Show me what I have been denying for all these years because I want the truth instead. Now that's a sincere invitation and Holy Spirit has permission to show you something that you might have forgotten. Paragraph number two. Bringing the ego to God is but to bring error to truth, where it stands corrected because it is the opposite of what it meets. It is undone because the contradiction can no longer stand. How long can contradiction stand when its impossible nature is clearly revealed? What disappears in light is not attacked. It merely vanishes because it is not true. Different realities are meaningless, for reality must be one. It cannot change with time or mood or chance. Its changelessness is what makes it real. 
This cannot be undone. Undoing is for unreality, and this reality will do for you. When you have a problem and you bring it to God, just like in that first sentence, bringing the ego to God is but to bring error to truth, where it stands corrected because it is the opposite of what it meets. It's like bringing something that you feel represents darkness into the light. You're bringing a problem into a place within you where there is no problem. You're bringing this idea of darkness, the absence of light, into the light. So it's not optional that God will help you or not help you. When you bring it into that holy meeting place of light within you and you spend a little time there, the problem is undone. It says, how long can a contradiction stand when its impossible nature is clearly revealed? What disappears in light is not attacked. So whatever the problem was, it's not attacked, it's not fixed, it's not solved, it's undone. It's like bringing the darkness to the light where it simply disappears. There's no attack, there's no fight. Every time you bring a problem to the Holy Spirit, it will be undone. Sometimes you think, well, it hasn't been. But that's because the door to the illusion is still open in your mind. And that door has to be closed, deadbolted in your mind, like keep it closed. If we try to bring something from darkness to the light, but we keep running back into the darkness or we're engaging the idea of darkness, then the light cannot be shown to us because we're making a different choice. I know sometimes it feels like nothing's happening, it's not happening fast enough, but then ask yourself, How many times are you engaging the problem and going back into worry and fear and what must I be doing wrong and I must not be listening right? And every time we do that, remember, we are choosing guilt again. And every time you choose guilt, it obscures the light. So we're learning those differences. This is a refinement of our journey. You're not doing anything wrong. Everyone here, I know you. I know each one here. (laughs) I know you're practicing. You're giving it all you've got, and we're so happy that you're doing that with us. Don't see it as if you're doing something wrong. These are refinements along the way. This is what waking up looks like. We're all practicing together. Give yourself that time to refine your practice because your guide is perfect and guarantees your success. Let's go to paragraph three. Merely by being what it is, does truth release you from everything that it is not. The atonement is so gentle, you need but whisper to it, and all its power will rush to your assistance and support. That's a beautiful sentence about the atonement is so gentle, you need but whisper to it, and all its power will rush to your assistance and support you. You might feel sometimes, well, how come that doesn't happen for me? You whisper to the Holy Spirit and it seems like no one is whispering back. But I tell you this, and it's the same with us, that when you feel like you're not getting the results, it's because you are still giving your attention to the lie. And with practice, you will stop. And with Holy Spirit's guidance, you will learn We all are on this learning path, and it's so tempting, isn't it? Say you see a car accident in the street, and someone looks like they're really severely hurt. You're rushing over to help them, and you might think, oh, my gosh, they're they're dying. One of the greatest things we can do while we're rushing over there is to remind ourselves that God did not create injury or pain or discomfort reject what we're seeing with our eyes while we're still rushing over to help, we can do both, then we are free to be the miracle worker. We are free to invite the Holy Spirit to decide for us about this whole scene in front of us because somebody, whoever sane or at the time, today it might be us, somebody on the scene is choosing the truth. We're rejecting the lie that we see playing out in front of us. This is a genuine invitation 
to experience the miracle instead of the problem. So we can still run over there. We can still call 911. We can still offer our help and our prayers, but we must shut down that lie in our mind. If we will, this is where you will see those miracles happen right in front of you. Sentence three. You are not frail with God beside you, yet without him you are nothing. The atonement offers you God. The gift that you refused is held by him in you. The Holy Spirit holds it there for you. God has not left his altar, though his worshippers placed other gods upon it. The temple still is holy, for the presence that dwells within it is holiness. I love sentence number three, especially that we are not frail with God beside us. And he tells us that if we need to say it a thousand times a day, who walks with me? Who walks with me? But when we are scared, God is not scared. When we are unhappy, God is not unhappy. When we don't know what to do, God knows what to do. And so we have this guide within us at all times that is not frail, not scared, not unclear, not confused. It's okay if you are or if I am because the guide within us is not. Remind yourself of this when you feel scared. Thank you, God, that the Holy Spirit is within me and that I don't have to have perfect thoughts because the Holy Spirit holds them for me. I don't have to be strong and powerful and circumvent all of my fearful thoughts because the Holy Spirit holds clarity for me. Really feel the gentle bliss of the team that is with you and that you have this presence of God within you that is not frail. Paragraph number four. In the temple, holiness waits quietly for the return of them that love it. The presence knows they will return to purity and to grace. The graciousness of God will take them gently in and cover all their sense of pain and loss with the immortal assurance of their Father's love. So many beautiful sentences here, but the graciousness of God will take them gently in and cover all their sense of pain and loss with the immortal assurance of their Father's love. Think how beautiful that is. And the temple he's referring to in the first sentence is within us. There is nothing outside of us. Everything is within us. And holiness waits quietly for the return of them that love it. And we do. And we do love our holiness. And we do love our meeting place. But we have gotten preoccupied with so many things that seemingly are happening outside of us through projection, and that is the purpose of the ego, is to keep us looking outside of us so that we will not turn inward and remember our meeting place. Sentence four. There, fear of death will be replaced with joy of life. For God is life, and they abide in life. Life is as holy as the holiness by which it was created. The presence of holiness lies in everything that lives. For holiness created life and leaves not what it created holy as itself. In sentence 7, it says, The presence of holiness lives in everything that lives. Even if we pause right there. Think of those people in your mind that are really seemingly evil, dark, destructive, mean. It's hard to imagine that the presence of holiness, capital P, capital H, the presence of holiness lives in everything that lives. Whenever we see darkness in anyone, he tells us the darkness is within our mind. Now, it's not that God created that darkness. It's that we are giving our attention to the absence of light. And so that is the darkness he's referring to. It's the X outside the circle, right? We're giving our attention over to something that is not so. And when we do this, 
people tend to show up on our life radar screen that represent darkness. Even if we spend one day in meditation, just thinking about those people we've seen, whether in the news or reading about them or knowing them directly, that um, those people that definitely seem to represent evil or darkness or hatred or attack, maybe we could just bring them into our holy meeting place and be willing to see that the presence of holiness lives within them. Say, Holy Spirit, I've been seeing these people as dark and evil and destructive, and I am determined to give you these images because I have no use for these images in my mind. I want only what is true. God did not create darkness, destruction, evil, and so I'm going to give you my old images, everything I have created and everything I've been validating as true in darkness, I give this to you and I want to see the light in these beings. I want to see the truth of them with you. You may think you're not doing anything at all, but I would say that you could imagine that the very next time that person that you are including tries to do something that's a little less than loving, they get stopped right in their tracks, and they can't. And you may never know this, and you may never know that your prayer mattered that much. But when you declare the truth, remember, when you bring a problem into the light of God, it is undone, not by choice, but by fact. Realize that your prayers go so much further than you can imagine, If you will pray for those that seem dark or evil, that you are bringing light to our whole world and you will see it. Paragraph number five. I was also just going to add, I was thinking about extrapolating out the presence of holiness lives in everything that lives. So there's holiness in our dog, Layla. There's Mm -hmm. holiness in mosquitoes. There's holiness in the bumblebee we found crawling across the sidewalk today that we lifted up and put him in a bush so no one would step on him. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> There's holiness in bushes and flowers and plants and trees and sharks and dolphins and elephants and giraffes and it's everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. It's really a beautiful thought too. The more we acknowledge it, the more we feel it and see it and experience it. Paragraph number five, and I put in the left column here the spotless mirror because we are all striving to become those spotless mirrors with a happy face there. Number five. In this world, you can become a spotless mirror in which the holiness of your creator shines forth from you to all around you. You can reflect heaven here. And just think of that. We can reflect heaven right here. One of my prayers, daily prayers, actually, is to become selfless which I have not accomplished, (laughs) I can say that with great honesty, but it is a goal to not let my ego drive my day or my personality. It still does more frequently than I would like, but we can become a spotless mirror. What if when we're talking to someone, our need to be right is noticed and neutralized before we act on it? Or when someone is sick, if we could be a spotless mirror, meaning that we would be willing to see them as whole and complete instead, even without their knowing, that's okay. Or if someone is lacking in some way or alone, if we could pause and be a spotless mirror for them, meaning we are going to shine back to them the truth of them, even when they forgot, especially when they forgot, and especially when they are not showing it to us. It's kind of a lofty goal, but it sure brings healing with it. So we can all practice on being spotless mirrors for other people. This is how we find that spotless mirror within ourselves. Number three. Well, I just have to reveal to everyone that you are selfless. And no, that, my I will. Thank you. I will accept that. I've got a good example. We bought a box of chocolate-covered macadamia nuts, and 
they were in individual wafers, but within each wafer there were two macadamia nuts. <laughs> and so we were each having one every day, and we figured out there was going to be one left on the last <laughs> day. So we agreed that we would break it in half and share the last piece together. Well, I forgot about it. And later that day, I remembered, oh, there should be half a macadamia nut chocolate covered in that box for me. <laughs> and I looked in there, and sure enough, the very last one was broken in half. Robin <laughs> only ate half and left the other half for me. That is selflessness. <laughs> <laughs> That's the true love, Terry. <laughs> because... I love chocolate-covered macadamia nuts. <laughs> and I know you would have done the same for me, so there is no way that I could eat that whole piece myself. So I don't know if it's selflessness, it's just love. <laughs> that is so funny. No secrets around here. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sentence number three. Yet no reflections of the images of other gods must dim the mirror that would hold God's reflection in it. Earth can reflect heaven or hell, God or the ego. You need but leave the mirror clean and clear of all the images of hidden darkness you have drawn upon it. God will shine upon it of himself. Only the clear reflection of himself can be perceived upon it. So we're here to keep our mirrors clean. A lot of Windex, right? So we need to practice not reflecting back what we see that troubles us, but instead to choose again each and every time and with the guidance of Holy Spirit. Sometimes we'll feel like we can't. It's just too troubling, whatever it is we're looking at. And that's where we can completely go to Holy Spirit and say, please decide for me about this. I'm having a lot of trouble seeing this differently, but I know that you are not. I was just sharing with someone earlier today, Terry, when you were chasing a dog around the house and you <laughs> broke your toe, basically. He ran yeah. into a coffee table or something, and I hear him yelp. And I turned, like, "What's what happened? And his second toe is so whacked. It's, like, pointed up and over. It's pointed towards the ceiling but like backward kind of I looked the, at him like oh my toe god next to the captain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness and so I said well we need to pray about this but I can't look at it <laughs> so it was just <laughs> freaking me out it just looked so awful but we did a prayer together and we chose to remember that God did not create injury Perry is not required to have pain and that he is not a body we shut the door on the injury and on the pain, everything the ego was offering as its gifts, and we said no, and we absolutely refused that idea. And then we asked Holy Spirit to decide for us. And I just remember saying, Holy Spirit, you decide for me. I'm not even going to look at it, but I know that it doesn't trouble you. Like, you handle it. It was so interesting because a couple of minutes went by, and we're kind of looking at each other like, okay, what now? Terry just said, well, I'm just kind of feeling guided to put it back in place. And I'm like, you sure about that? And he said, yeah, yeah, I feel okay about it. And he sat there and he put his toe back in place. It was remarkable. It didn't have really any swelling or darkness. This thing was a mess. Right. It just went right back. He had such a beautiful healing with it. Yeah, it was uh, initially numb. There really wasn't any feeling. And then after that, it was just slightly sore for a few days, and that was about it. And that was it. And I would have to say I think it was broken because it couldn't just be dislocated. It was ridiculous looking. It was really out of whack. Anyway, we shut down the lie, but I couldn't even look at it. It was just too hard to look at, and I prayed anyway. <laughs> It's not up to us to be perfect. It's up to us to turn to that which is perfect mm. within us. All right. Let's go to paragraph six. Reflections are seen in light. In darkness, they are obscure, and their meaning seems to lie only in shifting interpretations rather than in themselves. 
The reflection of God needs no interpretation. It is clear. That first sentence, reflections are seen in light. Sometimes you think, I'm not getting guidance, I'm not getting information, and I think of reflections as thoughts, reflections of the light, and reflections are seen in light. If we are focusing on darkness or the absence of light, darkness is not a truth, it's the absence of something. But if we're focusing on the absence of light, you're going to feel like those reflections are missing. It's almost like trying to find sun rays after you have closed your eyes. We want to get right back into the light, and if you don't know where it is, then ask Holy Spirit for the light within the Holy Spirit and to be your vision for you until you're able to see it for yourself. But that place, that meeting place, is always there and accessible. Number five. Clean but the mirror and the message that shines forth from what the mirror holds out for everyone to see, no one can fail to understand. It is the message that the Holy Spirit is holding to the mirror that is in him. He recognizes it because he has been taught his need for it, but knows not where to look to find it. Let him then see it in you and share it with you. There's that Windex again. Got to keep those mirrors clean. As we do, as we're willing to be a clean mirror for someone. And I love that idea because they're looking into our mirror and they're tempting us to judge them, to cast guilt upon them, to see them as wrong or hurtful or mean. Instead, we're returning a clean mirror. We are going to mirror the truth of them. It tells us here that they will recognize our clean mirror because they will find it when we shine it on them. If we will let them see it in us, then they will see it in themselves. So we can all aspire to get that Windex out in our mind and clean up those mirrors, see what we can do to reflect back to someone their holiness, even when they're being difficult, mean, and they're being snooty or snappy or (laughs) impatient, pause. God did not create impatience. These are the constructs we made, remember, making versus creating. We refuse them. We are the dreamer that no longer is interested in the darkened dream. Paragraph number seven. Could you but realize for a single instant The power of healing that the reflection of God shining in you can bring to all the world, you could not wait to make the mirror of your mind clean to receive the image of the holiness that heals the world. I just got this image of all of us with rags out cleaning our mirrors like, oh my gosh, (laughs) did you hear what he said? He said that the power of healing and the reflection of God shining in us is going to bring to all the world, and we're not going to wait to clean those mirrors. So we're all cleaning those mirrors. So just imagine that that which shines within us brings that healing and the reflection of God to all the world. We really are so much more significant than we think. We're not in touch with that yet, perhaps, But as we keep those mirrors clean and we are unwilling to reflect back to people our old thoughts and judgments and guilt, then we will see what is there and has always been. Sentence two. I got to do it. I feel it coming on, Robin. What? There's an an announcement coming. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Everyone, please clean your mirror. Please clean your mirror. That is all. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. Makes me want to run downstairs and clean my mirror. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sentence number two. The image of holiness that shines in your mind is not obscure and will not change. Its meaning to those who look upon it is not obscure. For everyone perceives it as the same. 
all bring their different problems to its healing light, and all their problems find but healing there. It's almost like we're sitting there with a blanket over our head. We're in the dark under the blanket, and we're trying to figure out how to get to the light. We think we caused this darkness to happen, and we're trying to fix that problem. We don't know we have this blanket over our head, and the blanket is guilt, basically, or the idea of separation and then the guilt that comes from that idea. So we've got this blanket over us. Holy Spirit's going to remove the blanket, but we have to sit under that blanket, and we have to choose to remember that God didn't create blankets. God didn't even create the darkness that we're experiencing right now. What we are experiencing is an illusion. It's not the truth. We actually want the truth more than we want the illusion. Then when we say, Holy Spirit, will you show me the light? I'm not seeing it, but I know that it's mine. I know it's my right to see it. I know that I have it within me, just don't know how to find it. Then the blanket is pulled off. Because we are wholly in alignment with our desire to join with what is true and to abandon what is false. But if I'm under the blanket and I'm trying to fix it or I'm trying to fix someone else under the blanket to get them to the light when I don't know where it is myself, then I'm in a situation where I'm asking Holy Spirit to help me see the light but I'm much more involved with what's going on under the blanket because I'm still trying to manage that myself. So let's begin to see that difference because it's not effort, it's choice. And we have to choose to acknowledge, wait a minute, I think I'm experiencing this darkness because somewhere in time I chose it. I forgive myself for that. I'm learning that Holy Spirit's going to show me how this will be undone, but I have to wholly want that. I have to recognize that what I have chosen doesn't mean anything. I've never changed the truth. In fact, I want the truth instead of what I have made. I don't have any interest for that. I'm not going to perpetuate that. Then the blanket comes off. So realize that we have to deny the denial of truth first, And then Holy Spirit can show us what is true. And if it happened before then, it would be an attack on our mind. That would be Holy Spirit trying to pull the blanket off while we're still trying to hold it on. So be aware when you are not wholly ready to let go of that blanket of darkness. You'll know because you're still trying to solve it. Let go of solving it. And remember it's not true. It is not so. Let's go to paragraph 8. The response of holiness to any form of error is always the same. There is no contradiction in what holiness calls forth. Its one response is healing without regard for what is brought to it. The response of holiness to any form of error is always the same. Again, it's like bringing that idea of darkness into the light. It is going to be healed unless we are still holding on to the darkness more than we are welcoming the light. And that's where we our work is. That's where our practice is. Sentence four, I love this whole remainder of the paragraph as we are being readied for heaven. Those who have learned to offer only healing because of the reflection of holiness in them, are ready at last for heaven. Their holiness is not a reflection, but rather the actual condition of what was but reflected to them here. Let's say someone that you know is being very difficult. We all can probably think of someone. Someone being very difficult, you can't seem to get them to change their mind or act differently No matter what you offer, it doesn't seem to help. So they're basically mirroring to you that they are difficult and that nothing you do matters or can change anything. If your mirror is not spotless, you're very likely to mirror back to them, yes, you are difficult. 
you are unreasonable and there's nothing I, I can do that can help this. So somebody shows you something and the clouded mirror validates the story. Basically says, you're right, you are difficult, this is a problem and we are at a standoff. The spotless mirror is going to use that opportunity for healing. And where he's saying there in number four, those who have learned to offer only healing because of the reflection of holiness in them are ready at last for heaven. So that's what we're striving to do is be the spotless mirror. So when someone's being difficult, before we respond to them, even if they're demanding a response right now, we're going to first remember, wait a minute, this person is showing me difficulty, they're showing me conflict, or they're making me feel threatened or intimidated or vulnerable or powerless. God did not create any of those conditions. Therefore, it is not real. I'm looking at my own projection. I'm looking at my denial of the truth. I'm not looking at the truth. We can quickly go to our mind and just say, this is not the truth. This is the lie that I created. I forgive myself and I forgive them. What we've just done is we've made our mirror spotless. Instead of validating what we think we see, we have used our thoughts to remember the truth and to shut down the lie. That's where Holy Spirit intervenes. Remember the sequence. Holy Spirit can now show us something else because we have denied the illusion we have made. If we can get to that place, and become spotless mirrors, and we can with practice. I know we haven't done it all the way, but every day it's better. If we can become those spotless mirrors and we learn to offer only healing in that moment, what that means is to choose to see the truth of them instead of what they are showing to us, just offering that space in our mind for the Holy Spirit to occupy instead of the ego to be validated. We are the chooser. This is where the holiness is not a reflection, but it's rather the actual condition of what was but reflected to us here. So that holiness becomes a known condition. We'll finish today with sentence six and seven. I was thinking maybe we didn't do sentence two in paragraph seven. Want me to read it anyway? Let's go ahead with sentence two in paragraph seven, and then we'll go back to the end. The image of holiness that shines in your mind is not obscure and will not change. Its meaning to those who look upon it is not obscure, for everyone perceives it as the same. All bring their different problems to its healing light, and all their problems find but healing there. I feel like we did read this, but if we did not, then let's just look at that image of holiness because it's not obscure. Feel the peace right now that the holiness within you is already there. It's not something you're trying to get to, work towards, gain God's good graces to get there. It's done. The holiness within you is done. It's in everyone that lives. He already told us that. Everyone, even those people where it seems to be completely absent. The holiness is there. That's the beauty is that we are just letting go of the things in our mind that are blocking our awareness of it. And so we are so glad to give that place to the Holy Spirit. And he tells us there that we bring our different problems to its healing light and all their problems find healing there. So we can always bring the problems to the healing light, but don't forget to close the door on the ideas that put the problems in place. We are the dreamer. We have to retract our own decision to let those problems thrive in our mind, to hold a place where we still are giving weight to the idea that separation is real. It's not real. It never happened. Darkness is not real. It's the reflection of the idea that separation is real, which it is not. 
and we are the dreamer, and we are the ones to shut that door. Let's finish tonight with sentence six and seven in paragraph number eight. God is no image, and his creations, as part of him, hold him in them, in truth. They do not merely reflect truth, for they are truth. We are learning through the course that we are truth. We're not just reflecting it. We are heaven. It's not just our home. We are love. There is nothing separate. All this that we are has been obscured in our mind, meaning we have been unaware of it for some time. The Holy Spirit is trying to wake us up to remember what is true. He says that we have been asleep for far too long. It's time to wake up and remember all that God has created within us. We will be so happy that we did. Let's go ahead and finish tonight with one of Terry's Q&As. All right, but I just have to say again, remember to clean your mirror. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> Wipe that mirror off. Keep That's that right. Clean. All right, so my closing Q&A. Question, what will make me happy while here on Earth? The answer comes in workbook lesson 64. The purpose of the world you see is to obscure your function of forgiveness and provide you with a justification for forgetting it. It is the temptation to abandon God and his son by taking on a physical form. Yet we have learned that the Holy Spirit has another use for all the illusions you have made, and therefore he sees another purpose in them. To the Holy Spirit, the world is a place where you learn to forgive yourself, what you think of as your sins. Your function here is to be the light of the world, a function given you by God. The world's salvation awaits your forgiveness because through it does the Son of God escape from all illusions and thus from all temptation. The Son of God is you. Only by fulfilling your function given you by God will you be happy. That is because your function is to be happy by using the means by which happiness becomes inevitable. There is no other way. Therefore, every time you choose whether or not to fulfill your function, you are really choosing whether or not to be happy. That's a beautiful thing. So we are here to offer our forgiveness. And forgiveness doesn't mean I forgive you for what you did wrong to me. It means I forgive you because I understand I am looking at my own projection in the place of truth. Whenever we are in that place of feeling upset, frustrated, scared, sad, depressed, then it's almost like we're standing in this house of light, but the back doors open. There's this sewage pipe that is coming through the back door, and it's flooding our house. And that's the thoughts of the ego that try to overtake our house and our mind. We do want to welcome the Holy Spirit, and that's like the front door is open. Holy Spirit, come on in, or the Holy Spirit's already in our house, but the back door, it's still open. What we're doing when we forgive someone, we're not saying I'm overlooking what you did to me. It means I recognize that I'm not looking at the truth. That's when we have shut the door on the sewage pipe. We're saying to our ego, lack is not real. We're saying to ourselves that sickness is impossible. God did not create it and that we cannot be alone, and we cannot be powerless or vulnerable or sick or sad. This is when we're shutting the back door so that sewage pipe does not fill up our house. So sometimes we think, well, where is Holy Spirit? I can't find him in my house. 
but it's because that back door has been left open. It must be closed in your mind, and then Holy Spirit will spruce up the house. No problem. So let's practice this together, everyone. We appreciate you so much for being here with us on your Saturday evening. We love you so much, and we walk with you, and we pray for you that you will know the abundance, the greatness, the happiness, the joy, companionship of God and your whole heavenly team, and we walk with you. We step back, and we let Holy Spirit lead the way. Hallelujah. Amen.